No. It's time for her, the need for more women at the political table. Now, there's one question I particularly hate when it comes to women in politics. I find it really frustrating, and I think it's fundamentally sexist. And I was once asked this question by a radio presenter during an interview, and he said to me, do you think that more women are progressing in politics without the sufficient uh, knowledge and experience? He was really hinting at that they were getting ahead on the basis of gender. Now, I didn't hesitate in my reply. I knew instantly what I was going to say back to him. And I answered with another question. I said to him, have you ever asked that question of a man? Touche. He acknowledged the point immediately. Now, I want to make three points about this because this question keeps popping up after the introduction of gender quotas here for the first time in the 2016 general election. And firstly, I want to point out that gender quota system introduced here means that the political parties have to ensure that 30% of their candidates are male or female, or they face a financial penalty. That's the stick. So that means that more women will get on the ballot paper and they will have an opportunity to contest the election, but they still have to fight and win a seat in Parliament. My second point is that the political research that was carried out after the general election found out that incumbents or those already serving as politicians had an electoral advantage. And guess what? Most sitting TDs, most parliamentarians are men. So they have a good start. They start with an advantage. And the third point I'll make about this is that when it comes to that radio interview and the point he was making about women getting ahead on the basis of gender, I'm sure over the years there have been countless men who have risen to the top of the political ladder and we could query their qualifications and their experience. Now, to be fair, some people have mixed views about gender quotas and some people have mixed views about quotas that are very much supportive of promoting women in politics. Why? Because they believe that women will be tarred as getting ahead on the basis of their gender and not their ability. And that really, it does a disservice to them. Now, in an ideal world, we wouldn't need gender quotas, but we're not living in an ideal world. And if we need to redress the imbalance, we're going to have to take progressive action. And even then, it's going to take such a long time to get parity. And I'm going to go to the numbers now, because this is a numbers game. Look at Ireland in 2016 after the general election. Such a big deal was made about gender quotas and the fact that more than 30 women were elected to our national parliament for the first time, to our doll. It was seen as a breakthrough, historic. But that, in fact, when you look at the numbers, just 35 out of 158 were elected. So that means that just over one in five of our elected representatives are women. And that's seen as a good day at the ballot box, would be. Now, if you look at America, much has been made of this pink wave following the US congressional elections because there are a record number of women now in the US Congress. But dig down into the numbers and you'll see that just 24% of the US Congress are women. And America and Ireland are not outliers, they're closer to the norm because the Interparliamentary Union has compiled research on 200 countries, and it looked at the percentage of women in the lower house of, of parliament or in a single parliament, and it found, wait for it, that in over 70% of those countries, women account for less than 30% of the elected representatives. And in just three countries, I repeat, three countries, they account for 50% or more of the elected representatives. Now, when it comes to the top job, and the top jobs even, it's even more depressing, because less than 20% of government minister positions around the world, women account for just less than 20%. And that's really important. Why is it important? Because we all hear about how it's so important to be at the table, to influence policy, laws, to be part of the decision-making. And women are a minority voice at that table. 
There's not enough of them sitting down at the table. So that is really, really important. Now, I wanted to understand why so few women are making it to the top of the political ladder. And I wanted to hear the stories of those who have succeeded. And that's why I wrote my book, Madam Politician. It was published in October 2018, and it became a number one bestseller. Now, what did these Irish Madam Politicians tell me? Well, first of all, surprise, surprise, they're a rare species. There's just 19 women have served as senior cabinet ministers in almost 100 years. 19. So I went and I asked each and every one of them for an interview and they all agreed. All 17 surviving ministers and also the former, two former female presidents, Mary Robinson and Mary McAleese. And their experiences bring home the additional pressures and double standards that women face in, in political life. And their experiences are not confined to Ireland. I think their themes are universal. Many women will identify with them, whether they're in different countries or in different careers. And I think it's really important that we hear about them. But first of all, I think it's also important to acknowledge that there has been significant societal and political changes since the 1970s. Back in the 70s, Ireland was almost a different country and certainly not a kind one to women. Women in the early 1970s had to give up their jobs in the public service when they got married. They couldn't buy contraceptives and they couldn't refuse to have sex with their husbands and you heard that correctly. So there have been huge changes and positive ones, societal ones, since the 1970s. Now it was particularly difficult for women on the campaign trail in the 70s and even the 80s. Mary Robinson was elected president of Ireland, the first woman to hold that office in 1990. But on two other occasions, she ran for our parliament and she failed on both occasions. And in the early 1980s, she had a one month old baby and she had to find, as she says, safe houses to breastfeed her child. And she was often told by voters, male and female, that she should be at home minding her child. During the course of her career, she also faced speculation and innuendo innuenda about the state of her marriage. And she was once called a lesbian Marxist bitch by a priest during a campaign. Now, I don't know which he thought was worse, the lesbian or the Marxist. Another senior politician, Nora Owen, who would become our second female minister for justice, also was asked frequently about her child minding arrangements when she first sought election in the early 1980s. And she poses a very legitimate question. She asks, how many men were asked that question? I think that's fair enough. Now, thankfully, women today don't face such societal judgments but I believe they still face additional pressures and double standards, and it is difficult to juggle a political life and family life. And some of the senior politicians that I interviewed in more recent times say they would not have gone forward for election or promotion if their children were still in primary school or under 12 years of age. Again, question, for how many men is that a consideration? Now, in terms of our national parliament, many in the, the 70s and 80s found it very intimidatory and macho. Now, it has improved vastly because there are more women in it and times have changed. But back in the 70s, many found it very, very male, and it was. There were more men in, the, in our national parliament called Michael than there were women representatives throughout the 70s. And I have nothing against men called Michael. Also, there were practical issues in relation to toilet facilities. And this was a kind of symbolism that summed up women in political life. They were on the periphery. There was no female toilet in the private members bar. And you may think that this is confined to Ireland. It is not. Believe it or not, in 2011, a ladies' toilet or restroom was introduced off the floor of the House of Representatives in America. 
I repeat, in 2011. Now, at Cabinet, women made small stands and fought small battles to ensure that they were not stereotyped. For instance, one former minister really, really was really determined <laughs> to ensure that she did not get stuck making the tea for her male colleagues. It was a small stand, but she felt an important one. In more recent times, some ministers have told me that they would often make a point at a cabinet meeting and it would be discussed, it would be viewed as a good idea, and then it would be referenced back to a man. I don't think that's confined to politics. I've been a journalist for almost 18 years. As a broadcast journalist, I would have covered so many general elections and referendums, and also as a political correspondent, I would have interviewed probably most of the main politicians over the last decade. And I remember back in 2016 being at a briefing and there was a press officer there and I asked a, a very difficult constitutional legal question. There was a question about it, uh, about the formation of a government. And the press officer deferred to a male colleague who was not part of the conversation to explain what I was asking. And thankfully, all my colleagues took issue with that. Now, of course, there are also other challenges for women in public life. They feel there are unofficial rules. They can't show emotion because many believe it's a sign of weakness and they don't want to be projected as the whinging or hysterical woman. Now, in her memoir about the last US presidential election, Hillary Clinton you know, raised this theme about women often being described as strident, feisty, high maintenance, emotional, all terms I hate. But she made the point that men are viewed as assertive and ambitious. And that's something that keeps coming up for women in different fields. You don't have to be in politics to empathize with that. Now, in terms of women in public life, there is also the unrelenting focus on women's appearance. One former minister that I spoke to said that she had been subjected to cruel commentary about her weight. She featured in an article about New Year's resolutions. The New Year's resolutions advice that she was given is that she should lose some weight. Now, what does that have to do with her job? And can I ask you, if you were part of a small group and someone made that comment, you would be mortified. I certainly would. Can you imagine that amplified in the media? Another former minister told me that she made a headline. Why? Because she wore the same outfit two days in a row. Wow. Would anyone notice if a man did? In fact, a US an Australian anchor, television anchor, did a little private study. He wore the same outfit for a year, allowing for dry cleaning, I hasten to add. And he found something really unusual. No one noticed. <laughs> and he made the point how many people would notice if that was his female co-anchor. Michelle Obama, in her memoir, talks about making becoming a news story one day. Why? What did she wear? Low heeled shoes as opposed to high heeled ones. And she often felt what she wore mattered more than what she said. Although I think most people agree that she readdressed that. And this isn't a phenomenon or a dynamic confined to one country. Also, many women in public life have been subjected to very crude, commentary and totally, utterly unacceptable behaviour that wouldn't be tolerated in any workplace. I interviewed a former female minister who had her bra strap tugged by the Taoiseach of the day, the equivalent of a prime minister in the early 1980s, Charlie High. She was flummoxed, speechless. And it has taken her four decades to come forward and feel comfortable to tell her story, thanks partly to the Me Too movement. Another woman I spoke to who was a, served as a minister, Neve Brannock, she was pushed in her national parliament chamber. She banged her head against a painting. Now, in her case, she did confide in someone the next morning. And that person said to her something quite sad. That person said to her, don't worry, he won't remember. He won't remember. Now, there was a meeting of female politicians from around the world in, in London. 
and many shared their experiences. And there was a report written up, and Harriet Harman, uh, the Labour Party British MP, said that many younger female politicians had been sexually harassed by older male colleagues. Now, thankfully, more women are coming forward. They are not prepared to remain silent. So there has been progress on many fronts, but not enough and not quickly enough. Women have to get to the table to make an impact. And that's why I do believe that we do need progressive actions like gender quotas. Why does it matter whether women are at the table or not? Well, a UN report has stated that women who are at the table, they champion gender equality issues, pensions, parental leave, childcare. So it matters, and it matters that their voices are not marginalized. And I think it's very timely that we have this conversation because in April, we are approaching the 100th anniversary of Countess Markovich, who was appointed our first female minister in Ireland. In fact, she was one of the first female ministers in the world. So it's very important and very timely that we have this conversation and that we put pressure on political leaders to redress the imbalance. So what would change really look like? And when will we know it, it has happened? Well, I always think of the Spanish government that was formed in 2018. It made international headlines. Why? It was such a shock. More women than men were appointed senior ministers. Now, can you imagine a time when no one notices when more women are in the cabinet, when it is normal? Well, that's real change. That's parity. And one day I hope a talk like this will be redundant.